I wanted to talk about one more summertime thing here, and that is anaphylaxis. And this is a relatively, hopefully short topic, uh, relatively short within uh, reason. And we'll try to finish up uh, just a minute after since we got started just a minute late. Uh, but overall, uh, anaphylaxis, I think, is one of those things that is critically important. It's one of those things, it's, it's sort of honestly like probably heat emergencies. Uh, it is out there, and it doesn't kill a lot of people, but when it does, it's pretty sensational uh, and kind of a tragedy because there's a lot of times a lot of stuff that we can do for folks that sometimes just don't happen. Um, and it is probably one of those diseases that much like, again, heat, stroke, and cardiac arrest, can't really wait for us to get to the hospital uh, to get it treated. We, whatever we're going to do, we got to do it pretty quickly, and that means on scene in the house. Um, so anaphylaxis is important and really relatively straightforward, at least in terms of the treatments that we in the EMS field or in the uh, emergency department, the stuff that we're going to do, fairly straightforward. So anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis starts off with uh, my friend here, Stanley the Mast Cell. So you have mast cells floating through your body. There's some of your immune cells. Uh, and for the most part, he hangs out. He's full of, you see all the little purple things in there. Those are little granules all full of uh, signaling uh, mediators, specifically histamine in, in Stanley's case here. <clears throat> uh, every one of those dark purple spots, a little vacuole full of histamine. Now Stanley's a helpful guy. He's important for our immune function. And the stuff that he does with our body is to help signal and help call for help. He's, he's sort of the neighborhood watch of the immune system. He is out there looking uh, and he will get us help. He will call all his friends that will come and help him uh, when there is trouble. Stanley is aided in his uh, quest by uh, <clears throat> Mervyn, the plasma cell here. Plasma cells are out there floating around as well and also part of the immune system. Plasma cells, uh, basically, his job is to hang out and look around. And when they identify something that looks foreign, some kind of piece of junk, a little piece of pollen, a granule of uh, you know, penicillin, something that the body doesn't recognize and that seems foreign to the body, uh, the plasma cell recognizes it, takes a look of it, takes a picture of it, and then starts generating antibodies uh, that have the that conform to the shape of that antigen, that piece of junk um, that uh, will react with it. Now, antibodies will go out, and of course, they'll coat on the uh, piece of pollen or the bit of penicillin or whatever it is. Uh, but they also go and stick on to the mast cells. So they stick on the outside of the mast cells, something like that. <clears throat> Um, now that we have body's been exposed to that piece of whatever you know whatever crud it is, uh, they will make antibodies to it. Antibodies will go out and stick on your mast cells, and then the mast cell just kind of bums around, and he literally just kind of uh, floats around the body, nothing much going on. Hey folks, how's it going? Just says hi to everybody, until he encounters that piece of junk again, or something that looks like that uh, that piece of junk or that piece of penicillin. At that point, uh, he goes into overdrive. He basically, it involves like cross-linking things and stuff. Uh, but when he recognizes that piece of junk is out there based on the antibodies on him, he begins this big explosion of uh, vacuoles and essentially poops out all of the uh, histamine granules that were inside him to start off with. And this is essentially like blowing a whistle. It's calling for help. It says, hey, I've identified this piece of stuff that's in here that's not supposed to be here, and I need help. It doesn't, the histamine itself doesn't really do a whole awful lot to that, you know, piece of junk, where this could be, you know, it's designed as like, this is a piece of bacteria, or this is a viral particle or something like that, um, <clears throat> or something that needs to, you know, needs to be taken care of by the immune system. Uh, the histamine doesn't really do much to it, but what it does is call other things. So the immune cells and, and the cells that actually help to break down things, macrophages and that kind of stuff, uh, as well as other immune modulators. Boy, I'm in right in the wrong spot, aren't I? Uh, the immune modulators that will call uh, and increase blood flow to the area. They call other blood cells to come around. Uh, it basically says, there's something here, come get it. And uh, just to prove that it, that is actually the case, you see that little uh, vacuole or granulated mast cell there, all the little purple dots, and in the right, uh, the one on the right, uh, they have all moved to the outside of the cell, and all the histamine gets dumped outside the cell. What's that do to your body? Uh, when that happens, it causes vasodilation, it causes leaky capillaries, 
and it basically causes fluid and cells to all kind of run into that area. Now, if you've just got one little localized spot, that's where you get a welt, a hive, uh, something like that. One little spot is where, you know, a mosquito bit you or you had a little contact dermatitis or something like that. Uh, immune system sends a bunch of little, uh, air, a bunch of cells to that area and you get a little, a little bump. Um, and that's basically the pathophysiology of anaphylaxis, but on a larger scale. So once you start to get more than just one little area involved, you know, more than just that one little bite site, if you happen to get contam you know, some sort of piece of uh, penicillin that's floating around your body because you got it through an IV or you orally absorbed it or something like that, now you have mast cells kind of all over the place activating themselves. And so you can get larger areas of it, like this child here who's got not only the hive type rash, uh, as well as some erythema on his cheeks, which again is <clears throat> uh, blood rushing to the area because it's recognized, hey, there's something going on here, there's some sort of foreign substance here. You also get angioedema in more sensitive areas. So he's got maybe a little swelling around his face, but also in his lips. Um, and we think of it when we say angioedema, everybody thinks like lisinopril. Well, angioedema just means swelling, um, like related to your vasculature. So that, that's what happens in anaphylaxis as well. So uh, when you get this generalized like release of histamine, you get the uh, skin changes. You also get changes potentially in your mucous membranes, uh, your tongue, your lips, any place that's like highly vascular, ha highly vascular may swell up. Um, <clears throat> Other places that you might have histamine floating around. You have histamine receptors in your gut. And when you stimulate a bunch of histamine release into your gut, you tend to get things like diarrhea and abdominal cramping, and as well as nausea and vomiting. And when you think about this, this, this sort of makes sense because if your body is sensing something foreign in there, like you've eaten something that's bad or uh, something that's bad has gotten into your GI tract, the body's natural defense is going to be to try to get that out. So it tries to evacuate everything uh, from above and from below. Now, that, that may not actually be what your body's thinking about doing, but it makes sense to me to say it that way, so I'm going to continue to say it that way. <clears throat> and with that, you get some pretty significant uh, GI cramping as well. Other places that you find uh, histamine receptors and effects of anaphylaxis in the lungs. Uh, so you get uh, potentially bronchorrhea. You get lots of secretions, nasal secretions, uh, oral secretions. You can get some uh, secretions down in your lungs themselves. This tends to be less than... Uh, <laughs> less than some of the other stuff like, you know, and uh, 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 nerve gas poisoning or something like that, uh, or cholinergic type stuff, but you still get uh, increased secretions and they can be difficult to manage. You get bronchial uh, swelling and irritation and uh, some smooth muscle contraction as a result of these as well. And again, the idea is things kind of shut down and you start coughing trying to expel this thing. In anaphylaxis, it goes too far. And not only does it shut down that one little area that may be affected by the uh, by the pathogen or by the piece of penicillin or whatever, but it goes can potentially go throughout the uh, small airways in your lungs. Um, and then you can get, again, some laryngeal edema or some angioedema of like your glottis or the structure, your periglottic uh, structures, which is a problem because you then stop breathing because you can't breathe anymore and you, you die from uh, obstruction. So that's bad. Uh, but mostly, again, we go back to we're excreting things and we're causing swelling and inflammation in areas. When you get to the vasculature itself, if this is a normal looking blood vessel with relatively good tone, when you get exposed to that piece of penicillin that's then floating around your body, uh, if you have a systemic anaphylactic reaction, everything in response to that large histamine load, uh, remember those little blood vessels will dilate. And if it's just a little dilated area on your skin, then you just you get a welt. If it happens all over your body, though, and suddenly you increase the total volume that your blood is supposed to be filling by, you know, 10% uh, systemically, then you drop your blood pressure. So you have a bigger hose uh, and you have to have more blood to fill it up with. And you usually can't make that blood like kind of right away. Uh, and so you become hypotensive. The other things that happen is that the capillaries themselves uh, and the blood vessels become leaky. So you notice that as, you know, that skin welt, that, that area of uh, fluid in the interstitium, uh, just from where fluid has leaked out. And that, that allows, you know, in an immune response, it allows uh, cells to reach out and inflammatory meteors to get out into the, into the space where the junk actually is. But if it's happening all over your body, then you get anasarca and you leak out uh, whatever fluid may be in your um uh, in your vascular space, into your interstitium. Uh, and so you get more hypotensive. So not only is the tank bigger, it's also leaky. 
And so trying to maintain perfusion with that big leaky tank that all of a sudden you have to try to fill up uh, is, is sort of a big deal. And I sort of mentioned the uh, edema stuff that goes along with it. So anaphylaxis is basically taking that welt that you got on your arm from where you got bitten by the mosquito and bringing it across your body. Uh, so you have many organ systems involved and uh, these folks get sick pretty quickly. Now, it is worth noting the difference between an allergy, which is a relatively minor thing, and anaphylaxis itself. Allergy is a bo the body's response to uh, some immune response to some sort of foreign little pathogen. Again, a little piece of penicillin, maybe it's radio contrast medium, something like that. It's a piece of uh, shrimp or something along those lines. And an allergy can happen, but it tends to be in a little localized fashion. It affects one organ system. One organ system can be your skin. One organ system could be your gut. Um, <clears throat> one organ system could be that your lip gets swollen, but it doesn't go anyplace else. Uh, and allergy itself, not that big a deal. Allergy is relatively straightforward. It's obnoxious. It's uh, potentially very uncomfortable, uh, but generally not life-threatening. Anaphylaxis is that allergy, but across the body, so affecting multiple organ systems. Uh, this is a big release of histamine, and when your body gets that big release of histamine, just like if you gave a shot, uh, if you gave a rat a big shot of histamine, what happens? They get edema, uh, they get bronchospasm, they get hypotensive, and then they die. <clears throat> uh, so it affects uh, all sorts of different body systems. And you, for the diagnostic criteria, you may see something like this, uh, which is not a bad way to lay it out, but it's a little bit confusing. How do you actually tell when someone doesn't just have an allergy or an allergic reaction, but is actual anaphylaxis, which is a uh, true time-sensitive medical emergency that has to be treated in essentially one way? Well, there's three different criteria for it, or not three different criteria, but three different ways that you might say that someone has potentially anaphylaxis, has this big uh, whole body spread. So one would be a known exposure to, uh, to an antigen or to something that you are allergic to. I know, so I know I'm allergic to peanuts, and I was exposed to a peanut, and then the person becomes hypotensive. So known exposure plus hypotension is anaphylaxis. And that sort of makes sense. Um, <clears throat> if you know it's there, and then all of a sudden you're inexplicably hypotension or hypotensive, even if you don't have rash, even if you don't have GI symptoms, if you don't have any respiratory symptoms, you're just suddenly hypotensive after getting exposed to your peanut, uh, or it's usually a drug that, that does this, um, that is anaphylaxis. Now, what are most people anaphylactic to? Most anaphylactic reactions in the developed world anyway, in kids, happen to one of two things. Uh, either to food, which is about 10% of the population has some sort of hypersensitivity to food, um, estimated, it's hard to tell, 100%, somewhere around 10%, and then insect stings. Food and insect stings in kids are the big triggers for it. Uh, in adults, it's a little bit different. Insect stings are still there. Um, between 1% and 3% of the population has a systemic reaction to uh, hymenoptera venom or, or bee stings, uh, wasp stings. Um, and then same thing, about 10% have some sort of reaction to drugs. So drugs are the more common uh, reason for anaphylaxis in the adult population. Stings are out there as number two. Interestingly, the, the more severe reactions, uh, of course, tend to happen among the folks that are older and more frail, have lots of medical problems like cardiovascular disease, uh, but really tends to happen in the hospital more than we probably realize. Uh, but that is where folks are getting exposed to drugs, uh, which is the big, one of the bigger reasons for anaphylaxis. Uh, again, outside of drugs, it's usually hymenoptera type stuff. And outside of that, uh, it's a grab bag, you know, shellfish, whatever, latex, tree nuts, that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> anyway, exposure to something that you know you're allergic to or you have a documented allergy to um, or a suspected allergy to essentially, and then hypotension gives you anaphylaxis. You don't have to be hypotensive, though. You could have a suspected exposure to something and then develop two uh, other body systems involved. So I'm exposed to something that, you know, or I should say I roll out to a patient um, he's been exposed to something, maybe he walked into a, uh, a place where he's never been around latex and there was a bunch of latex on the floor and a bunch of dust in the air. Um, he's exposed to it and then he develops uh, two or is involved in a two organ systems. So a skin rash plus difficulty breathing or um, <clears throat> mucous membrane changes plus hypotension 
or GI symptoms plus respiratory symptoms. Uh, you have a suspected exposure, even if you don't know you're allergic to it, and then two of uh, two body systems involved, that should be treated as anaphylaxis. So you've got either a known exposure and they're hypotensive, that gives you anaphylaxis. You have a suspected exposure uh, that involves two organ systems, that's anaphylaxis. The third one is you have the sudden onset of symptoms of skin rash, essentially, or swelling, and respiratory distress or hypotension. So it, you, know, you could have two organ systems involved and they don't have to be skin, but if all of a sudden you have skin and essentially a life-threatening process, so either respiratory difficulty or hypotension, that's anaphylaxis. That's the three diagnostic criteria. And if you use those, that gives you like a close to 90% sensitivity and like a 75% specificity in figuring out who's got anaphylaxis. For the most part, what we probably should be looking at is if you're sick and you've been exposed to something that you know that you are allergic to or documented to be allergic to, that's anaphylaxis. Uh, or if they have two organ systems involved and you think it is due to anaphylaxis or maybe due to an exposure um, or can't explain otherwise, then you should treat it as anaphylaxis, if that sort of makes sense. Um, that is about as dumbed down as I can sort of make it. Uh, but remember, sick plus an exposure is anaphylaxis uh, or two body systems uh, plus potentially an exposure should be treated as anaphylaxis. And then there's this third one. The idea behind this one, by the way, is that if you show up to somebody and, no, I haven't been exposed to anything, but I have this terrible rash and I'm hypotensive and I passed out, uh, that's meant to catch that as well. So that, that's where you get all the different criteria from. It is important to note that it, kind of what I was alluding to, just fulfilling the diagnostic criteria doesn't even if you don't 100% fulfill that or you can't remember the diagnostic criteria, uh, you don't have to have that in order to provide treatment. Uh, for anaphylaxis. There's these three different groups of stuff. If you get a little bit messed up, that's okay. You know, you can't, you can't remember them exactly. You just sort of remember like two body systems and there's something about a rash or something like that, or hypotension and a body system or something like that. The more important thing, rather than like doing the correct diagnosis, is that you provide early effective treatment for it. Because most of us can pick out allergy, whether or not it's true anaphylaxis, we probably under triage um, and just most people happen to turn out okay as a result. But for those folks that need treatment, we don't really have time to waste. And the, and the treatment is relatively uh, safe and relatively benign. So even if you can't remember or aren't 100% sure that they are a real anaphylaxis, if you're thinking, this looks anaphylaxis to me, you probably ought to treat them. And they're probably going to be okay even if you guessed wrong. By the way, effective treatment is important here. What is the effective treatment? There's one effective treatment for anaphylaxis. There are lots of effective treatments for allergies, but for anaphylaxis itself, the effective treatment is adrenaline uh, or epinephrine. And that is what you should give before you do anything else. If this is anaphylaxis, uh, then give adrenaline. So I just checked in the chat. There we go. <clears throat> um, <coughs> We talked a little bit about epinephrine before. What does epinephrine do? Uh, well, it affects your alpha-1 um, receptors, which gives you vasoconstriction, so you, you decrease the size of the tank. It helps to make your capillaries less leaky, so you decrease the amount of volume that you're spreading out into the interstitium, and it decreases edema in areas like your larynx and you know, your tongue, the places that you need to breathe in. So good there. It affects your uh, beta-1 receptors, which causes your heart to squeeze harder, gives you some inotropy, uh, and helps reverse the cardiac manifestations of this, the cardiac suppression that can happen with it. Uh, so good there. And then it affects your beta-2 receptors um, and helps decrease uh, or helps uh, provide smooth muscle relaxation. That helps to stabilize the or beta-2 helps to stabilize the mast cells. So you actually decrease the amount of, here, let me point to him. Yeah, there it goes. You decrease the amount of further histamine release that's going on with epinephrine, which none of your other treatments will do, and it helps relax some of your smooth, gut, uh, smooth muscle in your gut so you don't get that terrible abdominal cramp. So adrenaline ep epinephrine essentially affects all of the body systems that are involved with anaphylaxis and is a good treatment for it. There are many less or completely ineffective treatments for anaphylaxis that get given. And unfortunately, usually these get given kind of first because we have maybe a little bit of hesitation or we're a little bit scared to use the epinephrine because, oh man, epi, it's a big drug. Um, other stuff that we might give uh, just doesn't work as well. 
So you have H1 blockers uh, and H2 blockers, antihistamines. Okay, um, they work for the skin stuff. They make you less itchy and they can decrease uh, the rash. They might make that better. Uh, H2 blockers specifically affect your gut and it might make that, you know, maybe the discomfort a little bit better, may decrease some acid secretion, uh, maybe a little bit. But these are going to take at least, even if you give them uh, in the IV form, these are going to take minutes to hours to work. So uh, 30 to 40 minutes to, uh, to actually start taking effect if you give them orally, before they even start taking effect. Uh, if you give them IV, you're still looking at 10 or 20 minutes before it's actually effective. Um, and then again, they don't really affect the parts that we care about, which is, can you breathe? Are you hypotensive? Uh, are you still releasing lots of histamine that'll make it harder to breathe and you get more hypotensive? What about steroids? So steroids are out there. We give steroids a lot, right? Like solumedrol, uh, decadron, something like that. Everybody gets a dose of steroids whenever they get their anaphylaxis type stuff. Um, thing about steroids is that steroids don't work for three, four hours. The real effect of steroids happens far down the road because it's got to like get in there and mess with your DNA synthesis and your gene expression, that kind of stuff. So the real effect of steroids is later on. And it does true uh, in anaphylactic reactions, steroids seem to decrease the amount of the um, uh, length of stay in the hospital, but not the rate of admission to the hospital, not the rate of death, um, and they take a long time to happen. So if you had nothing else to do, you could give steroids, and there's maybe effect in five or ten minutes just by like a little bit of upregulation of some stuff, but for the most part, um, not going to be super helpful for the super acute symptoms that we have to deal with from an EMS side. Yeah, if you have it out there, okay, uh, but they've not been proven, not been shown to be of real benefit, and the pharmacokinetics of them don't work out towards it. So we're going to give epi. We're going to give lots of epi, or at least we're going to give an adequate dose of epi. How much epi should we be giving? The dose is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram IM, uh, <clears throat> which should look familiar as pediatric type dosing. And that's fine. If you just want to remember that, the max dose is probably somewhere around like uh, a half a milligram, uh, as you can see there. <clears throat> I would basically think when you're drawing this up, you're going to be drawing it up in a small syringe in little, you know, tenths of a milliliter, uh, which is a fairly small amount. And when you start talking about like little tiny kids where they have 0.1, uh, you know, I'm going to give uh, a tenth of a milliliter. Then you start having to talk about like, well, how much volume does the needle have? And did I switch needles out? And is, is this like the breakaway ampule where like uh, I had to use a filter needle and I got to sort all that stuff out? I would basically start thinking thinking of this in terms of I'm going to give like either 0 0.1, 0 0.3, or 0 0.5 uh, milligrams. <clears throat> um, because trying to make those little distinction otherwise is probably not really important and probably not all that helpful. So that's kind of my dosing. Like a little kid is going to get uh, 0.1 uh, milligrams or 0.1 milliliters. Um, a slightly bigger kid is going to get about 0.3 up into adolescence. And then I'm probably going to give an adult somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 mLs uh, or milligrams. Um, <clears throat> and that just makes it easy uh, for me. Like I said, when you get into small amounts, it starts to be very difficult to figure out. But the actual dose, if you're going to do it, is 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram uh, given IM. And you can repeat that in five minutes. Now, there may be a question, should we give, should we worry about giving, turn me off for a second here, the right dose, i.e. this is a 12 kilogram kid, or sorry, th let's say this, this is an eight kilogram kid uh, who is clearly an anaphylaxis, um, and I have a pediatric uh, epi injector, a pediatric um, <clears throat> epi pen, but it's got 0.15 milligrams, but I need to give 0 .0, uh, 0 0.09 milligrams if I'm going to give the actual right dose. What do I do? Do I try to draw it up out of the vial uh, to give that, uh, that 0 0.09 milliliters, or do I use the epi uh, pen, which has a theoretically higher dose? Well, here's what I would say. Yeah, the right dose is kind of nice, um, but that right dose is going to be really hard to draw up. Again, 0 0.09 milliliters of fluid. You got to get that up, and then you got to worry about the size of the needle and all that kind of stuff. Uh, could you just give the epi, just the epi pen? Yeah, because you can redose this stuff too, and probably even double the dose to start off with is probably okay in almost every kid, especially the kid that absolutely needs it. And kids will tolerate this just fine. Um, <clears throat> they're not, they're not going to die. They're not going to get an MI uh, because you get you used a um, 
pediatric EpiPen, and it gave him a little too high of a, a quote-unquote right dose. So in my mind, if you have the EpiPen available, it's dosed right. We know it's going to be effective almost certainly. And one of the big issues that we have in EMS is dosing of epinephrine for pediatric stuff across the board. That's probably our single biggest uh, dosing error that occurs. So if you had, if I had to say pick one or the other, I would say pick the EpiPen if you have it available, uh, even if it may be not the quote unquote exactly right dose. Now, that said, be very careful when you are dosing this because this is our biggest issue. If you don't have a pediatric EpiPen or, or whatever the other thing is, the off-brand EpiPen, um, if you don't have that available, then you are going to have to draw this up and you're going to have to take into account the volume of the needle um, and all the other stuff that we thought, oh man, I don't want to learn how to do this. That's going to become important in these little tiny volumes, so make sure you do it right. Another thing that's super important to mention, we should not be giving undiluted epi IV, that one to a thousand, you know, one milligram per ml epi that you're gonna be drawn up to give IM. Under no circumstances should you just push, they say, oh, I've got an IV, I can just push it in the IV, it'll be more effective. Ugh, super dangerous, uh, somewhat dangerous for old folks, but that will basically cause all the blood vessels in the immediate area to go and uh, probably cause some necrosis and certainly not gonna be helpful. So don't give undiluted uh, epi uh, via intravenous. <clears throat> If you get to the point that you've given IM epi, and maybe you've given a second IM epi, and the patient is still hypotensive, and they're still having trouble breathing and still wheezing a lot, and you've given them bronchodilators and all that stuff, um, at some point, you may need to move on in the severe cases to IV epinephrine, but you are going to have to do a little bit of preparation for it. A couple of different ways you can do that. One would be to give push dose epi which we're back to push dose epi, give you the real quick rundown. I suggest you take a milliliter of that same um, one milligram per ml or one to a thousand epi that you would have just given IM. Take one ml of that, which is a milligram, put it in a hundred ml bag of, <coughs> excuse me, saline, and that gives you 10 micrograms per ml. You can then draw that back out and you have your little push dose epi ready to go. And that, that concentration is just about right. You give one to two mls every, you know, three minutes, something like that, or until the patient gets better. Option two would be that you could actually just take a code, you know, a carp eject, the code epi, inject that into the bag, shake it around. Um, that gives you technically nine micrograms per ml, but close enough for government work if that's what you have available and that's what you're comfortable with. It's just not perfect, uh, but we'll still do what you want it to do. And you're going to give it again every two to three minutes until the patient gets better. That's push dose epi. Uh, and again, see our other information on it. Now, you could you do an epi drip, and uh, there's sort of two ways to do this. There's the traditional drip, and uh, if you give the traditional drip, I think that means that you are someone that cares about what they're doing, and you uh, are cautious, and you're a good provider. Uh, you're somebody that David Pfeiffer, for instance, could get down with, uh, somebody that takes a, a, really takes what they've learned in school, puts it all together, synthesizes it into a management plan, and, uh, and cares about their patients. <clears throat> so how might you do this? Uh, you might take a milligram of that adrenaline or that epinephrine. Again, the same thing you would have drawn out of that code or um, IM epi, same vial. You don't have to switch anything. Take one milliliter of that, inject it into a liter of saline, and then start uh, doing two mics per minute, which is going to work out, if you do all the math, basically two drops a second. And everybody knows how to use the, the 60 drop set. Everybody that's a paramedic has done this. Um, you can do that. All you have to do, if, if you follow this, you take a milliliter, you put it into a liter, and then you start at two drops a second. Uh, that will work out and that'll give you the, the correct dosing that starts there. And then you titrate until the patient gets better. The nice thing about this is that you know, number one, that if you see the drops going, you know that the epinephrine is actually flowing. Uh, and there's no question like, is the line kinked or something like that? You also know how much the patient is getting so that when you are ready to put them on a rate, when you've got it, uh, you know, when you've got things a little bit more stabilized, you can actually tell uh, whoever is going to put them on a pump if you have a pump, uh, and you can just use a pump, by the way, but if you're going to put them on a pump instead of the drip set, you'll be able to tell them, well, okay, I'm at, uh, instead of two drops a second, I'm at three drops a second, which is 180 a minute, and so that actually works out to three mics a minute, something like that, wherever you're at at the time. So that would be what I would advocate because we're all responsible, uh, <clears throat> responsible folks. There's this thing that if you're a paramedic that you're just kind of burned out and like Floyd here, uh, you just want to get the person out of your helicopter. Um, you might do this. 
it's basically the same process, but instead of looking at your drip set, you just turn it on and you make the uh, uh, 100 mLs in, or sorry, you take the one mL of um, uh, epinephrine, you put it into your uh, 1000 mL bag, and then you turn it on. And the patient does this, basically. All hell breaks loose, and you just sort of hope things get better when you do it. it now, I'm sort of being facetious here. Uh, you could do this, and I understand why. The idea behind this is we want to just give them epi, and the way that we will know that we've given enough is that the patient gets better. And in fact, that is a pretty good, reasonable thing to say. I'm going to titrate to patient effect. Okay. Uh, my problem with doing it in an uncontrolled setting like that is you have no idea how much the patient is getting. You really aren't paying attention to whether or not the patient is actually getting it if the tubing's kinked or if it's continuing to flow at that same route or if the vessel is actually clamped down or if the vessel is blown. You're, you're not really paying attention to that. You're just like turning it on. Um, which, of course, if you're the only person in the back of the ambulance, is going to happen. So if you're really not paying concerted attention to it, uh, I worry that we're sort of just kind of hanging on by the seat of our pants. And maybe sometimes you got to do that. And I understand. I'm sort of making fun of them. And certainly this Floyd actually uh, was saying, yeah, put them on a, put them on a rate whenever possible. Um, but uh, it's fun to make jokes about people. Anyway, um, <clears throat> The, the only real reason not to give a patient more epi is that they are fixed. So if they're still hypotensive, yeah, uh, they can have more, no matter what your upper limit of you know, an epi drip is. If they are still hypotensive or still symptomatic, uh, what they need is more epinephrine. So go ahead and do that. Now, one thing that I didn't mention before that is sort of important is there is this group of people, and we're not entirely sure who uh, or exactly what, and there's no lab test that'll tell you. There are some people that you'll, they'll have anaphylaxis, you'll fix them, you'll watch them, and then you, you know, you're not going to admit all these people to the hospital, but you may send them you know, home. There is a subgroup of people that 12 to 24 and sometimes a little bit longer hours later will develop rebound anaphylaxis, not really rebound anaphylaxis, but recurrent anaphylaxis, where the exact same thing will happen, no new exposure, it just happens to them again. Uh, super scary that any of these folks that we see, uh, could put, this could potentially happen to. It does happen to people that had more, <clears throat> more uh, impressive reactions to start with, got a lot of epi, um, folks that uh, had more severe reactions, and folks that are elderly, it seems to happen more in. But this could happen to pretty much anybody. So you could make two runs on the same person in a day um, using their EpiPen with no new exposure. There's not much you do differently about those folks other than be aware that it could happen and tell them, uh, number one, you need to go to the hospital even if we gave you the EpiPen and you're feeling better, you gotta go to the hospital and get checked out and watch for a while because this could happen, but also you need to go so that they can write you a prescription for another EpiPen so that you have it uh, if this happens or if this comes back in uh, 12 hours. So uh, just be aware that that is out there really scary because we don't know who is going to do it. And so we got to just kind of prepare everybody for it. So to sum up real quick, uh, epi in anaphylaxis is the drug. The rest of the drugs don't matter. It is epi. If you think it is anaphylaxis, it is epi. Uh, <clears throat> you can diagnose or make the idea of anaphylaxis as anybody who is has an exposure and is hypoxic or hypotensive uh, or who has an exposure and a rash and any other symptoms. So two body symptoms or really sick plus an exposure is anaphylaxis. And that's about the easiest way I can make it. Uh, diphenhydramine, Benadryl, Pepsid, all that stuff is okay if you've got a rash and you're a little bit itchy. Uh, it will make you feel better, uh, but it is not for anaphylaxis. Again, epinephrine is the first and essentially the only drug that matters in anaphylaxis. And the only reason not to give more of it is that the patient is fixed. So that's anaphylaxis in a nutshell. Again, check